Good evening, everybody. Brian Newbert here from GoldenBlack.com, live in the John Wooden Room uh, in Mackey Arena, uh, following Purdue's 82 to 76 win over Michigan. Uh, why am I in the John Wooden Room? Because the lights are off over Katy Court, and I can't shoot out there. Not because it wouldn't be a good video, but because I am terrified of the dark. Uh, this is your rap video following Purdue's 82 to 76 win once again over Michigan. It is brought to you by our friends at the Purdue Union Club Hotel. And the 811 Bistro, we appreciate their support very much. We will dive right into this now. Um, really important win for Purdue, obviously. Purdue's fifth in a row. Uh, you got to win your home games from here on out. You know, margin for error is, is preciously thin. And Purdue's now won five. Preciously thin. Does that make any sense? Perilously thin. Thank you. Uh, to no one in particular. Thank you to my memory for reminding me that that was a terrible word choice. Uh, and wholly incorrect. Um, Purdue's won five in a row now, headed into what is now the game of the year, uh, Tuesday against Illinois, uh, who won at Assembly Hall today. Not the old Illinois Assembly Hall, the current Indiana Assembly Hall. Um, with a win Tuesday night, Purdue can not only pull into a tie for first place in the Big Ten in the loss column, but also claim the tiebreaker for good over Illinois. And um, this is an opportunity now for Purdue to kind of reset the Big Ten race in its favor. Obviously, you still have to go to Wisconsin. You still have to go to Michigan State, things like that. You still have to go to Michigan. Uh, you still have to beat Indiana here. Indiana had Indiana beaten Illinois today in Assembly Hall. They would have been right in the conversation as well, uh, at least in terms of their record. But uh, this is a golden opportunity Tuesday for Purdue, again, to reset the Big Ten race after you know Purdue got out of the gate a little bit slow in Big Ten play, lost some games they you know should not have lost. Um, huge game, one of the biggest games in Mackey Arena that I can remember in terms of the stakes. Uh, so Purdue seems to have some pretty positive momentum going into that game. Uh, I think uh, you know they led this game from start to finish. I know it got a little squirmy, for lack of a better term, there in the last couple minutes when Michigan had it down to four. I don't think. I mean, I, I think maybe some of the ghosts of some past Purdue games have probably conditioned Purdue fans to expect the worst. Uh, but I think this was another one of those games where even when Michigan got within four, I don't think you know Purdue had ever really lost control or anything like that. Uh, feel free to, to disagree with me, but I never really felt like the outcome was, was in doubt. Um, that said, Purdue could do a better job, you know, not just protecting leads, but also delivering knockout punches earlier in games. Now that, that that's kind of a complicated topic um, because I think sometimes when Purdue gets in trouble, Purdue is trying too hard to deliver a knockout punch. So maybe me saying that would be enabling bad behavior on their part. I don't know, but I think you know Purdue had some opportunities to make really substantial kind of game blowing up runs really excellent use of the english language right there and my my diverse vocabulary game blowing up runs as a compound modifier that's what i'm that's what i've turned to uh, i'm so out of words and phrases that that's what i go to but i thought purdue had opportunities to really blow the game open in the first half this was a little bit of an outlier for purdue this year in the sense that they're only five of 18 from three-point range they got great looks in the first half. So when I'm saying Purdue couldn't deliver a knockout punch early in the game, they got the shots that could have led to that. They just didn't make them. Uh, obviously, sh some shots go in, some shots don't. It's not like that was a strategic measure that Purdue didn't play in such a way that would have gotten them a lead that Michigan simply could not get out of. Um, or I should put that better and say a lead that would have – basically ended the game in the first half. Um, Purdue just, you know, for whatever reason, had a ton of good looks from three-point range. I expect every three-pointer Mason Gillis takes to go in, um, every single one of them, because they all look the same, they all look perfect, and when he misses, he doesn't miss by much. They all get into the cylinder and pop out or whatever when he misses. Um, but I expect every shot he makes to go – he takes – to go in, but he's two of, two of five from three. Is that right? No, that's not right. Um, 
yeah, he's two of five from three. Obviously, expecting him to go five for five is unreasonable, but he had a couple of really good looks there that could have blown the game open. Jaden Ivey goes 0 for six, a little bit of normalization there. I think he took some long ones. I think he took some quick ones, um, but he more than made up for it with everything else he did in this game because he was, he was the singular difference uh, in this game. You know, how often is it Purdue plays Michigan? And it's Purdue that has the scoring guard that Michigan simply has no answer for. Uh, that was the case here today. Jaden Ivey basically did whatever he wanted off the dribble, either in transition or in half court. It seemed like he had more than three dunks. Um, but I guess it's according to the stats, it's only three. But he was just getting, getting to the basket, basically at will, getting in the lane at will, and really doing an unbelievable job, as I, I described it in my game story, killing, Purdue, killing Michigan's defense from the inside. I thought he did a really good job once again with his poise. I thought he did a really good job with his patience. He is really improving as an all-around player. The, the understanding of the game, things like that, the knowing how to play part of it is really catching up with the otherworldly athleticism, the zero to 60 in two seconds, speed, athleticism, quickness, burst, all of the things that very few of us in this world will ever have any semblance of understanding what it's like to, to exist with those sorts of physical tools. Um, he's learning how to play now uh, on the fly. And I've said this a bunch of times this season, it's like people view him as a finished product. He is nowhere near a finished product. You will see seven years from now when he's on his second contract in the NBA, you will see a player who's a finished product by then. But right now, he is, he is just scratching the surface still. And he showed today how awesome his raw materials are and how, how much the, the understanding of the game, the patience, the poise, all of that stuff is catching up to the athleticism and how much that matters. Uh, because in a game with a bunch of elite athletes on the floor and elite players on the floor, at least from an ability perspective, it was Ivy who gets 23 points, seven assists, only two turnovers, um, just was in com complete command of this game, uh, was the singular difference in this game. Um, you know, if he just has normal three-point shooting, you're looking at him scoring 25, 26 points. If Purdue has normal three-point shooting, um, you're looking at a guy who might have had 25 and, and, and 10 or 11 assists. He, he might have been flirting with a triple-double when all was said and done in this game. Um, but I think it was good for Purdue to have to, you know, win a game without being able to just snow people under, no pun intended, uh, topical right now, um, from the three-point line. Uh, you know, 5 of 18 is not on brand for Purdue this season. Uh, but it, it, it's probably a good thing, you know, in the big picture for them to not have that crutch in this particular game. I think obviously that'll normalize. Purdue will we'll shoot its normal percentages, you know, kind of from here on out. But uh, Purdue had to get in the lane uh, to win this game, and man, did they ever do so. Uh, they were at 44 points in the paint. They shot like 65% on two-point shots. They did a good job with their passing. They did a good job with their uh, playing off the dribble. They did a good job with their cuts, all of that stuff. And I, I think it was just a positive thing for Purdue to have to win a different way. When I say win a different way, you know, Travion Williams and Zach Eady obviously were still huge difference makers in this game. They just didn't have the support from the outside that 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 they normally have. But you know, obviously, it's it's a good thing when the opponent has a great center that you have two great centers and the opponent opponent only has one. And that was the case here tonight. Trayvon Williams was fantastic. Um, seven of eight from the floor, nineteen points, eight rebounds in only twenty three minutes. Won the game on defense basically, uh, which is not something I think we've, we've ever said about Travion Williams. Um, but the two turnovers from Hunter Dickinson that he helped force there late in the game were kind of produce, produce eureka moment in terms of getting the stops they needed to get to, you know, to close this game out, and he deserves a lot of credit uh, for that. It's a very complicated topic, in my opinion, uh, for Purdue, is Travion Williams reaching for stuff because the last thing you want to happen is for Trayvon Williams to pick up little touch fouls on the perimeter. You also need him challenging passes with his arms up high 
to a lot of the time. And when he reaches for balls, I, I, I tend to always expect bad things to happen. Yet good things always happen. So maybe it's my expectations that are swinging karma in his direction. I don't know, but the ball he knocked out off, off Hunter Dickinson is something that oftentimes if he missed by a centimeter, suddenly Hunter Dickinson's going to the foul line for two free points or a one and one whatever it was in that situation. Instead, it's a huge turnover uh, that Purdue generated. The next time down, he keeps his hands high. He challenges the pass from the penetrating guard down, down to Dickinson, forces the ball to be thrown at the seven-foot-one guy's feet. It's a turnover. Kind of the best of the best of both worlds there for Travion Williams in terms of reaching, but also keeping his hands high and, and really making impactful defensive plays. Uh, so good for him. That was a really, really uh, big time performance from him at both ends of the floor uh, tonight. Uh, the reason this was a game, obviously, was Hunter Dickinson. Um, you know that that stretch of jump shooting in the first half. If he's going to make shots like that, then you know obviously that's a really tough deal for Purdue to guard. Um, he was absolutely fantastic tonight. I've been saying since I covered him in high school that Hunter Dickinson is a 10, 15 year pro NBA guy. Uh, I don't know what the NBA is not seeing from him. I don't know if the NBA knows what he's doing. Maybe they should hire me because I have all the answers clearly. But Hunter Dickinson reeks to me of a guy right now. I don't know why I chose the word reeks. That's really weird. Of a guy who's going to get drafted in the second round by somebody He's going to do the Brad Miller thing where he makes a roster, he gets an opportunity, he plays well, and he's in the league for 15 years. And he makes $200 billion. He is like an honorary Gasol brother. He's, he's, he's got so much skill to him. He can shoot the ball from the perimeter. He's a fantastic passer. He's big enough. He can pick and pop. He can play, play and pick and rolls. Whether he can guard them or not, I, I don't know. But there are guys you know, in the NBA right now who are – are not ideal at, at pick and roll defense, but they make up for it at the other end of the floor and on the glass. And I think Dickinson's going to be one of those guys. Um, but he he was he was fantastic tonight. Kind of threw some stuff back at, at the crowd every now and then. He's a really competitive kid. You would have loved him had he come to Purdue. Uh, he did not. I don't know why. I don't know how that all went down. But um, he was really good, uh, really good. And Purdue's going to have its hands full with him in Ann Arbor. On Thursday, this is a really weird situation where these teams are playing twice in the span of five days, um, both in the middle or in Michigan's case at the start of a really grueling stretch of games. Purdue's going to be coming off a really what I assume will be a very physical game against Illinois, a very emotionally taxing game against Illinois. Uh, these are kind of the these are kind of the times that try men's souls during a Big Ten season, and uh, you know the the teams that are freshest and most mentally tough and most physically tough are going to have an advantage and this is a this is a good time to be deep and Purdue is deep this is a good time to have two centers who really wear on people and that's exactly what Purdue has so Purdue uh, you know obviously has some really big games ahead of it today but this was a game they, they really had to have uh, because I don't really know if you can really afford any more home losses the rest of the season that said you know, Illinois is really good. They're coming here Tuesday night. If Purdue can get that one, Purdue's got a really good chance to be uh, to be hanging a banner here uh, in a couple of months. So that's what I got, guys, from Purdue's. What the hell was the score? Eighty-two to seventy-six win over Michigan. Uh, I will talk to you all again Tuesday night after Purdue plays Illinois. Let's hope for all our sakes that one isn't as eventful uh, as the last one. I remember walking off the floor to that game to go write my story, not remembering anything that happened because it was so eventful. Um, so this has been brought to you by our friends at the Purdue Club Hotel and the 811 Bistro. Please uh, keep them in mind for all your lodging and culinary needs. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for reading. Thank you for listening. And thank you for processing our materials, however it is you process our materials. And thank you once again to, the, to those of you up in the upper arena who let us in on the steps after games. Thank you so much. You People do not understand. You are truly the best among us. We are scrambling to get to a press conference. We are, we, we are stressed out in the one minute of, of work we actually do during a week. And... Um, 
we appreciate your courtesy. So thank you very much. Also, if you like these videos, I, um, I keep forgetting to tag this at the end. If you like these videos, A, God bless you, but B, if you'd like and subscribe on YouTube, uh, we would appreciate that. For some reason, I think it's important. I don't know. I, I just see everybody else do it. So um, I'm nothing if not a follower. So thank you, everyone.